Good evening and welcome to our virtual fireside chat with Rensselaer Alumni Hall of Fame member and internationally acclaimed architect Peter Bolin from the Rensselaer class of 1958. My name is Dawn McCarthy from the Office of Alumni Relations at Rensselaer and it is my pleasure to bring this program to you alongside of Rensselaer School of Architecture and the Rensselaer Alumni Association. This fireside chat offers each of us the opportunity to hear about Peter's trajectory as an architect, sharing his story from Rensselaer to today. As part of today's program registration, we collected uh, questions from our registrants. Additionally, you can enter questions into the chat feature tonight. This program is recorded for future use and sharing on the alumni website at alumni.rpi.edu. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jason Hagopian from the Rensselaer class of 1992. He is also a member of the Rensselaer Alumni Association Board and the RAA's Chapters Committee Chair. Jason is the president and founder of Nuvio Architects, located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. After graduating, Jason spent 10 years working on in San Francisco before relocating to Florida. He now leads a team of licensed professionals servicing a wide range of projects, including retail, residential, commercial, medical, multifamily, hospitality, and cruise ship. Jason, turning it over to you. Thank you, Don, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Evan Douglas. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Douglas is the current Dean of Rensselaer School of Architecture. In recognition of his efforts over the last decade to elevate the reputation and status of the program internationally, he was recognized by Design Intelligence as one of the 30 most admired educators in the architectural, in architectural education four times over in the last eight years. In 2015, he was honored with the John Q. Hedgechuck Award presented by the Cooper Union Alumni Association to a graduate student of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture who has made an outstanding contribution to the theory, teaching, and or practice of architecture. Douglas's work has been exhibited at notable international venues such as the SAM Swiss Architecture Museum, Archilab in Orléans, France, the MOCA Museum at the Pacific Design Center in Los Angeles, Artist Space in New York, and both Rotterdam and London Biennales. His Helioscope project is in the permanent architecture collection at the Frac Center in Orléans, France, and his book, Autogenic Structures, highlighting his unique and innovative pedagogical approach was published by Taylor and Francis in 2008. And there's much, much more I could say, but it is my sincere pleasure uh, to pass the mic to Dean Douglas. Thank you. Well, Jason, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guest speaker tonight, I want to acknowledge Dawn and Jason and all those in alumni relations and the Rensselaer Alumni Association for their efforts organizing this special event. Uh, it's not very often that the School of Architecture gets the opportunity to celebrate one of our own distinguished alum in an all institute event. So we're very grateful for their efforts. Uh, I also wanna welcome all the Rensselaer alum attending this event uh, tonight, especially from the other four schools that have a genuine uh, interest in learning more about architecture from one of the most distinguished architects ever to graduate from Rensselaer. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all the practitioners that were kind enough to participate uh, in our all school job fair this afternoon uh, that were also invited to attend this evening's lecture as a token of our appreciation. I wanna thank all of them in advance for serving as future mentors uh, to our students. Um, a few comments about tonight's format. Dawn mentioned uh, uh, this a bit. Peter Boland's presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes followed by a 60 minute Q&A. And although I currently have some questions from the alum that I received prior to this evening's event, feel free to place more in the chat um, and uh, we'll try our best to have Peter respond to them. Thank you. It's a great pleasure 
an honor to introduce this evening one of the preeminent architects in the world today, Peter Bolin, class of 1958, revered by all of those around him that are familiar with his insatiable curiosity for knowledge, his deep appreciation for the natural world, his masterful command of the language of architecture as an inexhaustible resource of inspiration, and his unrelenting pursuit throughout his career in the making of great buildings. Peter Bolin is arguably one of the greatest architects in the profession worldwide over the last 50 years. Inspired early in life by Lou Kahn and Eros Saarinen, seminal mid-century icons, Bolin reinterpreted their heroic sense of modernism from a more tactile, and humanist perspective. Throughout his career, he's elevated the status and importance of the climatological conditions of a site, the tectonics of architectural construction, a respect for local materials, a sense of place as a spiritual imperative, and overall the sensuous nature of buildings in favor of establishing an enduring conversation with their surrounding context. Calling attention to the extraordinary insight, rigor, and intelligence in the work, the architect James Timberlake was quoted as saying in his presentation to the American Institute of Architects 2010 Gold Medal Award Committee, the jury that selected Bolin for its highest honor bestowed upon an individual practitioner annually by the AIA, and I quote, he makes great architecture for people. Peter moves from the log cabin to the glass box, from the initial conceptual sensibilities to the finely executed detail, from the abode to the civic center, with the same unassailable ethic. Peter Bolin reconnects us to that sense of awe and wonder of architecture in the landscape. As far back as his time at Rensselaer and Cranbrook Academy of Art, where Bolin received his B. Arch and M. Arch degrees, architecture has always preoccupied his imagination and served as a beautiful catalyst to propel him forward throughout his illustrious career. In 1965, Peter Bolin and Richard Powell founded Bolin Zawinski Jackson in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Over the years, the practice expanded to include studios in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Seattle, San Francisco and New York. With over 200 employees today, the firm's civic, university, corporate, and residential projects have received more than 750 regional, national, and international design awards, including three Committee on the Environment Top 10 Green Project Awards from the American Institute of Architects, AIA. In 1994, Bolin Zawinski Jackson received the AIA Architecture Firm Award, the most prestigious honor bestowed upon an architectural practice by the American Institute of Architects. With his 2010 Gold Medal Award from the AIA, Bolin joined the ranks of luminaries such as Thomas Jefferson, Frank Lloyd Wright, Le Corbusier, Luke Kahn, Ian Pei, Frank Gehry, and Renzo Piano. The great American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, a man is what he thinks about all day. Bolin has dedicated his entire life to exploring architecture as a deeply creative, cultural, technological, and poetic pursuit. His remarkable efforts over his legendary career have not only contributed to the historic lineage of our discipline, as a deeply artistic and cultural endeavor, but also left an indelible mark on countless people around the world that have been touched by the brilliant and timeless nature of his buildings. It is my honor and sincere pleasure to welcome Peter Bolin, a uniquely authentic, gifted, exceptional, and iconic architect and graduate of RPI back home to his alma mater this evening. Thanks, Evan. I'm so happy to be here.
and pleased to talk to you all. But Evan, you've said a good deal that now I won't have to touch on. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, I think I would just point out that the nature of people have been terribly important. <clears throat> Excuse me. The way everyone, I think every person that I've ever met is quite different. I've never met two people that are, even twins, um, that are identical. And it's so interesting to get inside of people, whether they're a, um, a, a, an older woman, one of my earliest clients, uh, who said, after a good deal of discussion, that what was most important to her emotionally was looking at the moon when she lay in bed. So I figured out how to make that possible to, to a great extent by looking at the arcs of the moon um, through all times of year and throughout each night. And it was a fascinating little challenge. Um, and on the other hand, to find the connection between what I would think of in the broad sense, technology and people and place. And Evan, you've already sort of touched on that, and I thank you. So uh, I don't think any of us can do everything ourselves by any means. And I believe that we do better, extraordinary things, which are not always possible, but when it aims to do that, um, together as people and not alone. And that's certainly been true in our practice. There are so many gifted people and thoughtful and insightful people, so I won't be able to give them the credit they deserve. Um, next. Robert will change these, there we go. When I was a child, you know, I grew up in the Bronx and and in Connecticut. And I spent a good deal of time, much of the year, in the natural landscape. And it was so, and it is, so touching and, and intriguing. Um, the nature of the light, the smell, the patterns, um, the sounds, such as a game of fly fishermen. And my dad taught me how to tie flies and getting at the nature of those trout, but also getting at the nature of each place. And that has carried me through my life, getting from here to there, which is a very important aspect of much architecture. Next. And just as a, a, a kind of reminder, um, the little stone house was done in the first grade in parochial school. The little sand shovel was done at RPI when we were asked to make it's not, I did decide not to do a shovel, but to do something you could use in many ways. And you would know, and it had to be done in the woodshop. And you would know, uh, the, if you wished, the nature of how it was made, not only that it was wood, but part was done on a, um, um, you know, it was a combination of, of of making those shapes that would be obvious if one wondered about it, and it would tell you about itself, and it would be therefore much more richer in a way to use. 
uh, because you could invent. And then Cranbrook, where we, it was possible to use the other studios, such as spending time in the in the uh, clay studio, making pots or finding out what clay did in your hands, what it's, as Lou Kahn would point out, the nature of the clay and its interaction with your self, your hands. Next. And um, Charles Eames was, had been, had graduated from Cranbrook. And by the way, a, a design teacher, um, Mort Gassman at RPI, suggested I then, after RPI, go to Cranbrook. And I'm indebted to him for having uh, uh, led me in that direction. And those of you who know Eames's work would could imagine how much we valued what he'd done and what he was doing, whether it was objects such as the early uh, storage unit that I look, Sally and I look at uh, whenever we go to bed or wake up, um, or uh, his house, which was amazing. Um, case study house uh, in the uh, early um, years after after the war. Next. And Cranbrook um, allowed me to follow many paths that I had begun to think about at RPI. The whole issue of moving through the landscape and under the landscape and changing one's point of view, um, thinking of ways to both express how things work, but also to begin to look at how within those desires, one could also um, make uh, forms that recognized where the sun was, um, how you move through the building, um, and so on. Next. I had started spelunking in uh, high school. We had a great cave on the property of uh, Salisbury School. And um, I think I was the only person, by the way, at the school who, at least in the beginning, had a Bronx accent, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and I was one of the youngest. But um, you can see the result of that in that little sketch that was about getting from here to there and not seeing the ocean until one entered that space down through those tunnels and forms that brought light from above and finally ended up in a room where that would acoustically work extraordinarily well by catching the sound of the surf below and uh, and and shaping that sound uh, within the cave-like structure. And of course, that grew from my interest in among a number uh, that came from a study of primitive buildings, which started at RPI and then extended through my years at Cranbrook, I used to give talks on that subject to children, for instance. Next. And I think the great uh, the, uh, uh, study for probably all architects might be looking at primitive buildings in their particular circumstance, uh, the climate, which is, varies about the world, uh, the materials that are available, the nature of humans, and so on, whether it's uh, adobe-like materials that we see uh, throughout the world in those um, varied places that shared uh, a similar climates and materials, or those structures and 
buildings built out of reeds, such as these here in uh, southern Iraq, in the marshes in southern Iraq. And I don't know if they're still there or whether they're inhabited at this point. And that's a fascinating study. We could spend several hours just on that subject. And I used to uh, when I had left school and began to teach. Next. And of course, that leads one to admire the connection between making humans and what the humans would do with those things that they made, such as wood boats, as we see on the left. But then beyond that, and this is just an, an analogy or, or an example, uh, the sailing ships and how they are. And one would wish that buildings perhaps had those qualities that were on one hand quite extraordinary um, in the connection between making and what they are for humans and other and, and, and so on and so on and so on. Two examples that are very touching but are very much about being made and that can go way beyond what we think of traditionally as architecture. Next. And so earlier in my career, I, I first, the first job we did was a house with my mom and dad. And we were fortunate that it was in the New York Times. And that was in, in, in Pennsylvania. But 10 years later, my dad had retired and their accommodation was, which it's an important word, not compromise, accommodation. And I think that's true of much of architecture, it should be. Um, uh, they had a, a site actually in land that we lived, uh, we lived nearby in a forest um, that you approached over once probably was a, a platform for logging. And you went from the shade to light. And I aimed to make a building for my mom and dad, understanding them quite well. I knew my mom within six inches, six inches in a kitchen in her kitchen. You know, you, you, that's one advantage of doing more than one building for a person. Next. And it floats over the landscape, which has water running through it in the spring thaws. And you move from that little path through ferns to entering a building that then opens up to the forest. It is contrary to the, uh, a lot of, Things we were told in school, such as you face the sun, and so on and so on. And of course, I began to wonder things like, why are Harry's, Harry Seidler's buildings in Australia backwards? And of course, the reason is he's below uh, the equator. Sally's reminding me to move faster, which I will. And you must pardon that. Next. And yet the, the side to the east is a flat wall that tells you about it's the nature of the plan and the objects behind that wall as con contrasted to the other sides. Next. And so I'm now going to move much faster through residences over the year, and I'm not, I had to pick some because otherwise this lecture would go much longer. Whether it's the, it's the, uh, the ledge house up above, we were hired in uh, for a site, to look at a site in Maryland, where it was near Camp David. Um, uh, and they wished to use materials that we would see in the Adirondacks. The lower 
two images are for Bill Gates and about halfway through the process for Melinda. And that's an underground garage on the right. And that was done teamed with Jimmy Cutler, who had worked in her office, had gone to Penn, and then um, moved to Seattle, and I felt. And we were both uh, among 25 firms uh, that uh, Gates and his team um, asked to compete, and we won. Next. So over the years, the buildings have, have, have ranged greatly, but often um, with, uh, I think, a great sense and, 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 and in relation to the people from that little house in Connecticut near Kent to this other house out in Utah on a ski area for a client who had had cancer and she was told now she should swim every day. I thought we better make a place indoors that was extraordinary pleasure, pleasure for her. Next. Or this farm in Rhode Island uh, on the edge of the ocean uh, in, um, um, in a, a wonderful landscape. And it's a historic farm. And so we wrestled with, and it was a competition. Um, but we didn't, we said we wouldn't compete. <laughs> and they, they selected us. Um, um, with a house, the older, not the oldest house, and an older house, the small one on the lower left, to a barn that was quite dilapidated. Uh, and we brought it all back. And what a pleasure that was. Next. And we still work there. To Hawaii, where uh, on one hand, we did a private gallery below uh, a volcano that's extinct. And, another, and a house for another client about uh, 10 miles away along the edge of the ocean that has a garden on its roof. And we've done a, also um, a, um, another structure now, but we haven't photographed it yet. Next. Well, this house near Bend, Oregon, that is in a way, a, a, had the kind of interests that were um, very much embedded in the case study buildings. Um, it's quite, it's a thoughtful and rather economical system that is lined up along the edge of a, of an, of a one kind of forest facing several uh, extinct volcanoes and at the edge of what had once been lava. Next. To this house on the upper two slides in Michigan, on Lake Michigan, in the heavily forested dunes, to also a more recent um, foundation for the crafts and arts. Uh, which again, for a great client, who we continue to work for. Next. To um, this little house for Nick LaHue, who's an extraordinary photographer, one of our favorite, we traded services actually. And, and this is at Point Roberts, which is a bit of Canada that drops below the line above uh, the San Juans, um, and and again an extraordinary site, built with very simple materials, at a very tight budget. Next, and this house is very recent, um, the last, and it's only about a mile and a half, or perhaps a, mile, a little less, from here. And this is the second house we've done for that client, 
who now has Alzheimer's and they had to make a house that would be on one level with no thresholds and it was quite legible and yet related to the great landscape. And that's been a great pleasure for all of us. Next. And where we are now, we're in that room at the lower left. Oh, sorry, lower right. And that those masses that you see behind me have one study and the other a bathroom. So, and the, and the couch is really built in. It could be two beds for our grandchildren. And it was once a little black church that had turned into a house, but a, a bit of a, not a totally satisfying house. So we tuned it. Next. And finally, um, this is uh, Creekside um, in uh, just in, in Woodside, California. And it slipped in and then filled the landscape. So it's, it's very dreamy, as you see here. Next. And yet it's very close to the San Andreas Fault. I, mean, I, I think some of these things will interest those of you who not only are architects, but engineers of one sort or another. How we managed to make this so light and uh, graceful was that uh, next, you know, that roof is stabilized horizontally uh, by the the uh, the mass of that library and a kitchen, uh, which is elsewhere in that pavilion. And then, and we it was such a pleasure, in this case with a bigger budget. Um, we had started with very modest budgets um, to be able to get great crafts, craft, uh, to do this with great craft. And beyond that, to uh, take these masses and then arrange them loosely, which is something that many architects, uh, would interest many architects. Next. And it relates on that backside where the where the cantilever was to the forest of great oak trees and so on. Next. And inside, again, here there you see the library, the back of or the side of the library, that stiffens that rather light structure. I mean we could take the vertical loads, but the horizontal load are almost entirely taken up with those masses. Um, and we had started working for Steve Jobs doing Apple uh, and first Pixar, but then Apple. And so we were working with great engineers such as James O'Callaghan, who's a Brit, but now in New York as well, and figured out how we could do that projection for the children uh, without uh, having any structure in the glass. So it's a, a glass, half a glass, or a third of a glass cube, in effect. Next. And there you can see the plan. Those are calm elements, and then they've been pushed and pulled a bit to uh, fit into the landscape and to make a much more powerful experience walking through. And that, um, on the right, that is uh, the pavilion you see at the very top of that little plan. And, um, and it looks into the forest, but that desk is by Chiro in this house with our client, we were able to, to do much more, we much more advent, uh, adventurous, um, working often with modernist 
historic modernist furniture, most of which were modern antiques. And that's the Shiro, who, as you know, did um, Maison de Verre in Paris. Um, I don't know if any of you could guess what's on the left wall, but that's donated or given by one of our other clients who might have done a few things. And that is an, the only astronaut underwear out of captivity that I know of. You know, with little tubes to heat and cool and so on. Next. And I thought you'd appreciate uh, the level of detail on this building. And we've begun to get quite serious, and I wish I'd done it much earlier in my life, uh, hardware, for instance. And it's just that, you know, you're almost too practical. And of course, I could have always done it, but I didn't know I could always have done it, technically and economically. Next. And lastly, um, this is uh, some, there are outbuildings on this site, two buildings that were the foundations of older buildings and therefore we could build, if we use those or put set in those same positions, we could put them very close to that little stream. And there are others and they've been published elsewhere. And uh, uh, Todd Williams and, and Billy uh, have written very nicely about these things in that, those buildings. Next. And there is the hardware from various buildings, including Steve's, Steve Weiss, Steve, Steve Jobs' wife in the lower right, uh, which is in a, 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 a build, building built out of logs. And we continue to do that to the extent that we have the opportunity and often the time and energy. Next. So now I'm switching a little quickly. Um, this is sort of a path through our life where we've been thinking about uh, the sun, uh, the movement of air, um, um, and all those things that go to make a workable and a very rich architecture. And in this, both cases, uh, these are for children. And in both cases, they're operated by the children. They're both Girl Scout camps. And you can see us thinking about all those issues. And you go next, next. Um, I'm sorry, go back one. And, and again, here at, um, um, Pocono Environmental Education Center, uh, done later than the others. Again, the kids operate it. The, they will remember this all their lives. And you can see, in this case, this building is all uh, passive solar. And of course, brings in air low and, and, and exhausts it high and works in the, in the, at the different sun angles, which you're seeing in the little diagrams. Next. And Robert Miller and team and I did this building that, uh, in uh, the Ballard Library, which is also a neighborhood center for the city. And again, um, is, brings light in away from the direct sun um, it and it turns out even when you face north the, in that part of the country really you want to mute that light and so you can hardly see them but if you look carefully uh, there is a louver that we uh, shaped on those big windows facing north and you can see I think at one point it was the largest green roof in uh, that region. And the children on the right are looking at a little 
at a uh, through a periscope that we designed and the way we designed it we did it flat on the floor in the office till we got everything right and you can just see the edge of panels uh, active panels solar panels just in the foreground of the middle of the lower photo so these all represent a kind of intelligent and our intention let's say was to make things that are intelligent and responsive but also very re quite responsive to the nature of people and the place this being ballard which is very close to where boats are and sailing boats and so on next and two city halls again representing that range of intention interest and intention of in this case all sorts of solar devices um such as the screened um and that that also bounce light which all of all of us are familiar with but also the movement through the building as we're seeing in this image and the next on a steep slide site which much of seattle is on steep land and so we saw that and took advantage of that with these stairs and where people could move from the major levels in the building to the grades or to the lower streets and be mindful of the sun in the in the same experience next and the inside making stairs also a place where people could sit and uh, by using a double height steps and so on and there once a week they have performances in the city hall um, and that's the stair that people would take to the council chamber and the if you look carefully on the photo in the middle, you'll see there's a glass bridge and the glass is supporting that bridge. And they, that again was James O'Callaghan. And it was part of the art in the building, you know, the art allowance. Next. <clears throat> and this was a competition we won to do again uh, as teens. I mean, there's no, I don't believe any individual can do all of this. Um, and we would work together. And the result is no doubt, in my mind, at least in our case, better than it would have been if any one of us tried to do it all. We couldn't. Um, and this is dealing again, this is a city hall in, um, Newport Beach in Southern California, and it it is on a slopey site, not terribly slope, but enough, and it climbs that site with these roofs that both shade the interior um, and bounce light in, um, and also uh, ventilate. And that in that climate. We're able to do what I think is a very democratic building where everything is accessible um, and, and people move through. It's not a kind of institutional box. Next, we won the competition and then I, I know they're set up, very pleased. Next. And great gatherings occur between that long extended structure and the uh, extension of the end of an existing library and the parking, which is to the left in these two photos. Again, it's so, it's, it is so nice to be rational and not trapped, on the other hand, uh, to be responsive to the people and their needs in this case to make a democratic, what I think was a democratic building. Next. So, Steve Jobs. He, when we were working on Bill Gates's, and I think it had nothing to do with that, 
he hired us to do the first major structure for Pixar. And this was uh, just, it was between Berkeley, I think in Berkeley and Oakland. And in an, in an area with industrial buildings that had sawtooth roofs for good reason, bringing in uh, Northern Light. And we used those forms and we used steel that was not painted, but was clear coated. So it looked like blued, bluing. Um, and we made a great big building with a gathering place in the middle. Next. People gathering and you would then put those things that require or, or um, are opportunities for people to eat or gather for other functions or have conferences, which are in the upper, in the left lower photo. It's um, on the upper level overlooking the bottom. Next. And we looked at that pretty carefully how we framed uh, so it told you of itself. Um, and that, again, I believe is not done as often at both the practical and emotional level as it might be. But certainly in this building for Steve, it was important. Next. And you can, and then the workspaces were for teams and groups that could change over time because this frame sort of in effect, we made all the services work and we made room for adjustable team space. Next. And then Steve asked us to begin to work on Apple. He was told by others that he would not succeed. And I remember him saying, if we don't make the stores, we will be marginalized. And so we set out not to let Apple be marginalized. And um, probably the most notable of our early structures, um, and by then we'd gotten through the more, um, some of the more obvious things that um, you, most people were doing for retail were quickly got to structures such as the one on Fifth Avenue. And next, and we also thought about how to make these special things and with great consultants and teams of ours and others, boy, that worked intensely, <laughs> very tiring actually, but ex exhausting. But on the other hand, with great pleasure and satisfaction. And those were a little sketch I did. Actually, it was on a paper neck, a paper tablecloth that summarized as we were looking at the alternate strategies uh, for this plaza in front of the GM building in New York. And on it, you will, if you could, you, if you could see this large enough, you could spot the beginnings of our scheme. Next. Oh, and can you go back for one moment? The reason everyone knows is a little casual, but I had to wear that or wore that because I was due that afternoon to go up to RPI. Uh, and it was that when the school, so wonderfully for certainly me, um, gave me a doctorate. And I mentioned this to uh, Harry Macklow, who then owned the GM building. And he said, I said, a free, I'm getting a free degree. He said, Peter, nothing is free. So next. That's why I had a tie on. Um, 
But you can imagine thinking about how people move. You can imagine up and down, because it's underground is usually a failure, has been traditionally, and yet it can draw people and be magic. And that's what we intended to do. And we had the right client to do it. Um, next, and we designed, the, for instance, the elevator. We designed the stair. We did all of that, right down to the details, which we improved over from project to project. Next, I, I, I couldn't, I can't, couldn't show more in any reasonable amount of time, except to hint at. I think we did about some more straightforward, but many intriguing, uh, about 250 of these. And there are a few of the interesting ones, some overseas. Next. I'm, I'm switching again now, because I'm trying to run through this. Um, I, uh, edu education. Um, you will recognize RPI on the top. Uh, and that we did with Dick Riddleman's firm, and we did that together. You know, it was our Pittsburgh office, so I was quite involved. And below are some of the work at Carnegie Mellon. The, on the left is one of the earliest of our large university buildings, and that's the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon, right across the street from a cathedral. And uh, again, I could, I'd could, i love to have shown you a number of images and drawings and sketches. Sally's reminding me, I better watch it um, on time. And two other projects at Carnegie Mellon, both of which are quite varied and quite interesting. Next. And at the University of Washington. And at Trinity. Next. And at, at uh, uh, Colorado School of Mines. Um, I purposely put some a number of projects, many of which relate to technology and people. We've done two major projects there that are right at the focus of that campus and were intent on shaping that experience for the students and everyone. And of course, to make buildings that functioned well for their each purpose. Next. And below, lastly, um, just three images of the library at Williams. But I would suggest to those of you who are still in school that you might want to go over and visit. It's an interesting, uh, and, and I'd be happy to get you diagrams that showed, and that was in that team, the key person that team uh, was uh, Frank Grauman, another RPI grad. Next. In a very recent building, and they, we don't have final photos yet. These were taken just, uh, I think, perhaps last summer and we dedicated it in the fall. A number of these projects such as this are because of clients we've worked for on other kinds of things. In this case, for this client, Tom Siebel, originally a house, and we had been recommended by Harvey Kaiser, another architect from our class, who is, you know, some of you know, was head of uh, campus, um, development and planning at Syracuse, and he recommended us for those wood buildings, the timber buildings, but also to Tom Siebel for that kind of building. But here, this is the second building he paid for at Champagne Urbana or Urbana Champagne in Illinois. This is a, and I'm almost done now. Uh, this is a design center, and uh, which the first that I'm aware of was at 
at Stanford in, in, in existing buildings, but it's one where the, te the students aren't taught. They work together on projects. And there are a number of these now in the country and they're all quite different. In this case, I think we had an ideal circumstance in that it's on a great, uh, it's called the military axis. And it's a great green. This is one end of it. And if you really look at that kind of program, ideally, you want to really have a lot of interaction. Next. And therefore, it's on two levels. One just about three feet above grade and the other below. So we could bring light in to below around the edge and also down through the middle. And two levels works well so that you have no stairs uh, without having a ramp. You work with ramps and you will have a stair or two, but there are always ramps for the handicapped and that opens up the inner parts of the building, which I think will continue to transform itself over the next years as the students produce more and more um, design for various needs uh, in this building. Next. And lastly, as far as building types, tall buildings, just showing one and um, this very much involved with Robert Miller, and I loved working on this with the team. And um, it's two towers connected by commercial uh, uh, office and office space next um, in the Northwest. And I think the diagrams are of interest you find it's a concrete frame, and we had a tight budget. However, it, um, the, the framing spreads as it gets to the parking levels to put the columns where they're almost inevitably needed for the, an intelligent parking garage. And above, <clears throat> they've shifted and there's sort of limits to how, to what extent you can do this technically and make it work uh, uh, to frame the uh, offices, oh, the, the uh, um, apartments above with a simple core in the middle of each of those uh, towers for stairs and elevators and circulation. Next. But what a pleasure. We've done additional work for this client, and we've done a tower in Hawaii, and we're working on others. Next. Lastly, this is at Falling Water. We had done a, a, a renovation and addition to a barn at Falling Water. Um, but this is housing, special housing, and for students of various ages, and a workspace that's a porch, screen porch, which you see in the foreground in that photo, at the upper end of a field. And so you really were thinking about sun, how you approach, how you deal with a limited budget, and um, how you, you, and there's an existing house that we connected this to and made work. It was a split level from the 50s that we sort of transformed its use. Next. That's Bill Luce in the left and I standing in the field below the buildings. You drive toward the buildings, you approach through that forest, you go by an old little two, two-car garage from the 50s. That was a prefabbed house, by the way, I think. Um, and then you see these buildings sort of floating above the field. Next. Gives you a sense of that. And very 
interesting to us, and yet it had to be done with pretty economical means. And finally, next. And yet, then we took the two-story garage and the uh, equipment is in the garage itself. And then we extended it with really simple means, and we gloried in those simple means. And that's Bill working with the students in the middle. Thank you. Oh, and finally, I guess I should just say, uh, we thrive on interaction and getting at the nature of things and getting at things that are in a way hybrids and ideally that are good stuff. So thanks very much. Hey, Peter, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was extraordinary. And I know that it, it wasn't easy to take uh, a career as extensive and prolific and insightful and ingenious as yours and try to reduce it to um, yeah, it's hard. Slides. You could you could turn that into four uh, much more complete presentations, but to do it in one is really interesting. I've never had to do that before. Well, this with is this, a yeah, yeah. With a limited amount of time, because my talks might go two or three hours. <laughs> oh no, of course, no, of course. Uh, it's it was titled uh, uh, by alumni relations as a fireside chat. So. Uh, imagine us in uh, in one of your buildings uh, out in the woods and uh, maybe no more than than 50, 60 people. The fireplace is on and you either have a, a, a glass of water and or brandy. I have a glass of water. <laughs> there you go. At, at, at a small coffee, maybe an Eileen Gray coffee table uh, <laughs> between the two of us. And then there's it's an open informal discussion. So uh, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, uh, we do have some questions uh, from the alum, and and I have looked over the um, the participant list, and it's a really kind of a uh, beautiful uh, community, a kind of spectrum, multi generational group. Some mostly architects, and I'm sure there's some non architects. Uh, some of the dean's leadership council members. You're distinguished colleagues and students uh, that are currently uh, in the program right now. So as you and I discussed, there, there are many ways to kind of um, curate this discussion. Some uh, would uh, uh, address a particular uh, cohort, um, and that's OK. It may go in many places. But the first question, and this comes from an anonymous uh, RAA board member, uh, which architects <laughs> and other people were most influential to you in your career? Well, there, there are several ways of thinking about people. Uh, one is, um, but I don't think you're asking this particular question. Uh, Mark Gassman did an extraordinary thing for me when he saw that with the grounding I had at RPI, which was invaluable. I mean, you can see the aspects of that in much of the work where I was trying to always, we were trying or intending to make things that would work, you know, and that weren't total BS. <laughs> and yet to make them rich and powerful and expressive of how they're made and what the climate is, what each place is, uh, how groups of people interact as opposed to individuals and so on. And so that mix of RPI and Cranbrook was to me extra extraordinary. So who? Well, first I would say that my first very best teacher was Gerhard Kalman in the first job I had while at RPI. And he went on, as you know, to, to uh, Boston City Hall and a number of other very good buildings. But at the time, he was teaching at Princeton and at Columbia. And he took such, he had such a powerful influence on me from the point of view of wondering what was the right thing. 
and getting at that. Um, as far as, and of course, there were people like Eames who had gone to Cranbrook and came back. He was he and Iro were very good friends, mm -hmm. and so they'd work together often. And he'd always spend time in the studio. That was of great interest, and uh, and and powerful experience, but radically different than what you would think about. And if you think about um, if it, in, in other architects in the world, certainly Wright was of interest, but he had these funny roots back to the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And and so we really had to read between the lines in a way. Uh, Lou Kahn was extraordinary interest, but somehow, and but he was Lou Kahn, and he came out of that particular um, and I think his buildings seem to be more logical than they truly were uh, in many cases. And I don't mean that as a terrible criticism, but you're always looking at how in that time that you're doing things, you get it right for, every, for people in that circumstance and do things that people love. Um, and then there are any number. My favorite um, of the Scandinavians is Leverance or Lorenz. And, and many architects aren't familiar, who was a classicist as many people were and became a modernist. And that that's of interest. Well, what, what uh, do, can you dig a little deeper? What was specific about his work that attracted you towards it? Well, that shift from classicism to modernism of his, it's very personal. Right. That's interesting. Right. And yet he was delving into how you use materials such as, you know, the churches that he did late in his career. Mm -hmm. uh, the mortar was like about that thick. <laughs> right, right, right. And it, it was a whole nother way of opening up those doors and you know, we experimented with windows that were sort of clipped on the outside of the building rather than in holes in the building. And and do it, and of course, you had to do it without it leaking, which we, we did once or twice, and of course, they usually leak a little eventually, maybe not right away. But then there are other ways of solving it where you're still getting at that kind of a issue. And, and that is to me, uh, I, I think another architect, by the way, that is of interest in a way is, um, um, no, 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 no. who did the Ford House? I mean, guys like Mies were, of course, very interesting. Um, Bruce Goff. Right. Bruce Goff was interesting because the, there was a British publication ages ago that said he was the only truly American architect. That's interesting. interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> and maybe he was, you know, he didn't have a formal education. Right. And Very, very eccentric work. Yeah, well, eccentric, but some of it at least was really interesting and quite worthy. I mean, really good stuff. And so you feel your way between all of that as you search for what you believe within your circumstance. I mean, you know, much of what we've done was for relatively modest things. And then, of course, other things happened that weren't quite so modest. Um, we, uh, we started out, it was a, I was sure I'd have to leave this part of Pennsylvania within five years. And Dick Powell, when we started, and by the way, Dick was another graduate of RBI, but mm -hmm. I bet you one of the very few that was an All-American lacrosse player twice. Mm -hmm. And went to the Olympics in, I think it was 52, when uh, lacrosse was a, a, um, a, a, a demonstration sport. And there is an article in the London Times, or whatever it is, said 
that he scored more goals than all the opposing teams. <laughs> I'm going to, in a short time, ask you about your partners. But on this particular topic, we've been speaking about the discipline of architecture. Uh, were there other disciplines such as painting, literature, music, and dance that influenced uh, your architecture research and creative vision over the years? Anyone in particular um, that stood out? Well, uh, uh, many are fascinating. Uh, Sally ran a symphony, but I'm not very musical at all. Mm -hmm. She, I think she'd kindly say that I am, <laughs> but I'm mm -hmm. not. Um, my mom thought I should be, she, I should be a, a musician perhaps. And I had to take piano four years and I, I can't even find middle C now. So <laughs> I hated it. Right. However, it stuck with me a bit. Um, and music is an extraordinary art, if you wish to call it that, mm -hmm. an extraordinary human endeavor. Um, and of course, when I was at RPI, uh, Don Moshan uh, took some people down to New York to look at some of those great abstract expressionist shows that were then going on. Um, so, and my, my sister is a weaver, oh. but not, uh, she's a great weaver and not doing, uh, you know, cozy, uh, bits of clothing or something. Right. And, and so, and that's because I was at Cranbrook and she had gone to Skidmore and as in the arts program there, but she wished to take the next steps. And a number of my classmates were uh, at Haystack, which Ed Barnes had done in Maine, an extraordinary place. And I think it was the best building Ed Barnes did, at least from my point of view. And um, so, I think, and, and, and you know, if some, there, when I was at Cranbrook, there was always arg students arguing about craft versus art. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's much difference. Mm -hmm. But uh, ideally, there's not much difference. So. Okay, um, here's a question. I'm sorry, I, I, I went a little sideways on no. that one. But that, I thought, that, well, all this stuff that you run into in your life are quite interesting. No, absolutely. Uh, this is from Donald uh, Lipcomb, class of 76, Michelle Norton, class of 78. Okay. And I'll just kind of combine the questions. As a member uh, of the architecture class of 1976, I valued your commitment and presence among us as a visiting professor that year. What inspired you to come back to RPI and what projects were you working on at the time in your practice? Well, um... In those years, I killed two deer uh, going back and forth from uh, Troy to northeastern Pennsylvania, <laughs> usually at night at late hours. Right. Um, I, I think because we all are, we're architects. And so it's extraordinary to spend time with younger architects and as people did with us, you know, there were people that we all learned and and, and, and I just used Gary Kelman, Gerard Kelman as the great biggest example. But I remember uh, teachers at school who were really interesting. Uh, one that I remember clearly was Bob Winnie because he had done a house that was really a sort of interesting thing where he would shape bits that most architects wouldn't think about. And I've done that during my life to some extent and done it differently, but right. at least been motivated by that. Um, you said, what 
was I doing then? And what years were those? Like, well, I might have been working on my mom and dad's house. The 76. second one. Yeah. 1976. Well, and that was a legendary project for you. Um, yes. Yeah, it may be in some ways. The interesting thing is about that. I think that Bill Gates put us on the list because of that house. Now, that probably was an architectural advisor he had. But you know that member that uh, Goldberger put that on the cover of the housing magazine in, mm. for the New York Times. Um, and now he's working on this bio. Um, but uh, and there were other things we were doing, and like the, we had just done that first Girl Scout camp. Right. Right. Um, here, here's this is a, a, a question comment from uh, Michael Oatman, who who teaches in the School of Architecture. Uh, he's a tenured faculty member, a senior faculty member. In fact, hi, Peter. Beautiful lecture life work. Wondering what specific lessons you've taken forward into your large scale non residential work from the first house you designed for your parents. Also, what were the revelations from your first build projects that you didn't anticipate as a student making drawings and models in the classroom? Thank you. Two questions. How did the uh, residential, early residential work uh, influence your large scale non residential work? Well, they all have to do with human beings. Mm -hmm. Whether groups or individuals, or at least they should be. Um, and actually, I didn't show you a number of things, many things, that were in, that we did in the early part of our career. Um, we do about one low-income housing project a year, and that started probably about when I was doing my house, the house for my mom and dad, the second one. Um, and we did, they were pretty good, because, but there's a limit to what you can do, you know, because you're, it's driven by budget and driven by having the basic program. But you can do a lot of good things. You can make, you can begin to develop a hierarchy of spaces because you do have vertical circulation and you have elevators and that, and you can begin to see how people group and interact. And then you can make gardens, like if you have a laundry room, you put it next to uh, on the ground floor where everyone can get at it, but also because um, a garden next to that space is a perfect thing for people to interact with and have their own garden. And so you think about all those social issues, you work with very economical materials, but we were so discouraged and I, I don't mean to make a political statement here, but I guess I am. When Reagan came in, because his people were did not want um, um, public housing and, and 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 that kind of um, you know government supported housing uh, to be like market housing. And so we gave it up. Now that was, I didn't get into those subjects today. I guess I could good, do a talk about those kinds of disappointments when there was a limit to what you could do. And you always have to decide what is right and what can you do. And I wish I had done more things like uh, later in a career, but really concentrate on what people touch among other things, and what they not only touch with their hands, but with their feet, mm -hmm. and how they move, how they sit, all of that. On that and note, then, go ahead, Peter. I, so I've answered that one. Yeah. The second Peter. half of the question, I, I suppose, if I could paraphrase, um, is trying to call attention to the transition from uh, college and uh, both the RPI and your experience at Cranbrook, and then your first built project and uh, were there any um, surprises, revelations when you moved 
uh, out of a, a time in your life where you were dealing with entirely representational, you, you, you were moving from, from the university, academia, where everything was representational drawings and models, yep. and then you built something full scale. Was, I, I imagine for anyone that there's a kind of beautiful my, my revelation, feeling, and my, maybe you could call attention yes, to that. I can, I can address that. Yes. Um, among other things, most institutional uh, programs tend to not encourage, and, and many, you know, there's such, the institutions have a lot of people that have to do with shaping what they wish to make and how they go about it. Um, I think often one can make the budgets work, and then it's a question of wondering to what extent you can vary the experience of spaces. The the varying uh, can vary uh, the quality of light in a lot of these places. Can build in more flexibility because inevitably most building types these days will change someday, and you can begin to predict that. Um, down to almost any time you do a big building, you've got a few special entrances and you can look harder at what people touch, for instance, the hardware. Mm -hmm. And so, and the rails. Now you learn from others. Uh, Aspen did that great handrail, and several times he did great handrails, um, um, such as at the library and you know in, in stockholm and so you if people are willing to think about those things you you can make a much richer place for people and be very sensible and so i guess that that addresses part of that question yes it does um on the on the question of scale um obviously and by the way i'm happy to talk as long as anyone is listening <laughs> and so and so am i and to 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 Dawn and Jason, I, I think it's a, a, a given uh, Peter's stature and the value of this conversation, we'd, we'd love to go a little over here. So Peter, the, the next comment question, um, obviously you find tremendous interest uh, in working at various scales from large institutional and commercial buildings to a small house and even door hardware. Yeah, we've never given that up. Yeah, listen, can you share with, it, with us how you've been able to manage the project's objects with the same amount of care and consideration at all these scales because not all architects are able to be successful changing scales in their practice. Yes. Well, you know, economically, I think if, if it probably doesn't make sense um, because you put such energy into little things and you could get away with not. And those are the habits of our profession. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I certainly didn't start with that in desire and intention. And we pulled it off. But I know is, as our practice continues into the future, that will be a constant question and challenge. And I, I think, uh, and actually, modernism has given much of that up. And even when it's rather creative, only at the large. Okay. So, Peter, you were you were talking. You said you weren't sure that you've been successful with the scale, but you know it was interesting that your slide presentation you showed a disproportionate number of houses, even though I know you have as you have hundreds and hundreds more large scale buildings, but I'm assuming the houses- And hundreds of houses. <laughs> the houses um, serve as a kind of conceptual core manifesto of some of your interests and that they're very legible and accessible and in some cases, uh, very elemental. And more, and and more easily uh, refined in, in ways that it's hard to do on often on larger buildings. However, 
Um, I do think that the motive, one's intentions or desires are similar, can be, because we it would be ideal in our culture now. I mean, if you look back 50 years, 100 years, or maybe more, we then had more detail in our larger buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, and you know, they, they leaned on that often uh, looking at um, it, uh, uh, many elements coming out of the past, out of history. Or the, and modernism gave the, a lot of that away. And I understand why, but in a way it's a shame that there is not, generally speaking, and it's I mean, that's not true, uh, that we gave it an awful, we paid a very big price in not doing, um, uh, finding an equivalent way of making uh, richer buildings. Mm -hmm. And yet we are in a time when we still can and some people absolutely, we all would do it a little differently. And some people are doing that. Um, sort of inventing and making within the means of, partly it's a matter of limitations of what we can, what our construction means or industries can do. But I do think there are lots of ways to still shift the quality of light, um, shift the quality of uh, the, the, in so many ways, and we'd all find different ways to humanize. Right. And even in a large building that's somewhat driven by institutional requirements. And I, I'm not sure that um, we have gotten into that as far as we should, including ourselves. Right. Just out of curiosity, uh, there was a comment question here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go back. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, Gerardo Brown... Manrique, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, from 1970 to 71. And uh, he he says, Peter, I have great admiration for your work and over the years have enjoyed the handful of times we've actually met in Troy in Oxford, Ohio. This was a very wonderful overview of your work. One question, uh, so I can, in quotes, use your work in seminars and studios. Can you be classified as a critical regionalist? a humanist or something else well there those uh, that's all of interest and you don't necessarily have to be classified right <laughs> i would prefer to be just classified as a yeah, pretty good architect okay but i i suppose more specifically did uh kenneth frampton's uh essay resonate with you no Okay. Oh, it might have. He said nice things, but not really. I mean, if you think about my background at RPI, which is fairly straightforward, but they put up with me is sort of pushing and pulling a bit, <laughs> for lack of a better way of saying it. Right. Um, and then uh, what I was seeing at Canberra, concluding what Eames had been doing, and looking at people like Asplund, beginning to look at all those guys from all of the, and looking at primitive buildings a lot and wondering a good deal, all that would add up to something of real interest. And it almost came naturally. Now you'd look at what people were writing and that was of interest and of value, but that's not what triggered it. It may have tuned it a bit or nudged it but if you just search and and i think the true it's true now that there are ways of making um 
what I think of it as more humane and inter and interactive and emotionally and intellectually in some ways. There are ways of doing that. We should keep searching because if we don't, we will make more and more institutional like buildings, what I think of that way. And ones and find all of these qualities elsewhere than in buildings. And I'm not sure that's all good. Buildings should somehow live up to uh, this range of being produced, mass produced sometimes. You know, my our last project at RPI, in my case, uh, you know, for my thesis was industrialized housing. And I don't think I solved it then, but I tried. No, it's interesting, Peter. I, I a longer discussion, but um, you you have such an affection for drawings and the immediacy that a drawing, a sketch has been able to offer you in terms of uh, identifying the conceptual core of the project. But in light of our discussion about vertical regionalism and uh, humanism, it, it, it seems, you know, uh, excuse the pun, what does the brick want to be? In yeah. your case, what, what is the, what, what, how can the building uh, contribute to, to, to the site and a sense of place that, that is profound and meaningful? And those sections seem to clarify in, in a very eloquent and concise manner uh, how to have a conversation with, with uh, uh, natural uh, context in such a way that the building itself begins to kind of develop uh, uh, the design around those priority interests. Well, it can reveal some of those qualities around it and in turn be shaped to some extent by it. And then the question is, how, how do you choose your means to do that? Um, and, you know, among other things, it's a, it's a matter of adjusting truth in a way or deciding what's true and what isn't it. I don't know if I said that right. But, you know, you look at, for instance, Jefferson's uh, buildings at the University of Virginia, like the range. Right. I mean, there is a wood classical, wood classical buildings on the range. Now, I don't think that's wrong to have done that. Or um, I mean, it's particularly interesting because probably the Greek temples really grew out of wood buildings, at least that's what some people have said, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think all those are good questions. And then the question is just how you go at it. And I think sometimes it, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the more postmodern era, which is a, sort of about a third of the way through my career, um, which we're all affected by to some extent, although we tried to get rid of it in its more super, superficial aspects, in my view. Um, they became too much a kind of cartoon of the past. Mm -hmm. So it's really very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and no, no, I do. I, I did want to underscore to the students who are watching, and this isn't a qualitative statement in terms of saying that one era is better than the other, but they're each representational system has its own bias and uh, predilection in terms of what it's favoring, even unconsciously. And one thing that's quite obvious about the use of the pencil, a uh, uh, pre-computer, was that one could draw the section or the plan as an isolated projection and, and get to a kind of a concentrated ideal right away. That's true. Whereas, whereas the well, architects today- But there's no it. reason to give away tools. You can, I guess, I would argue that someone should be great with uh, um, you know, the most advanced technologies, but not give up the older tools that were maybe in some ways revealed a different um, 
a sort of a different world in a way, or a different way of delving into things. Yeah, I mean, I, what I suppose my common observation was about isolating certain projections within a building to identify the main concept, and at the proper time, decide to go back to the 3D model. Um, yeah. And many students today lose sight of that. And I, I think your your sketch sections are remarkably important because they yeah. identify. Again, I'm repeating myself, but they they identify the potent aspects. <laughs> environmental issues, you know, the cloud, the sun, the angle yes. of the sun path, the whole thing. Um, yeah. I'm going to move on. This is from Ted Krieger, another faculty in the. School of Architecture. I don't know if he's still on with us, but uh, I know he's he's always had an enormous amount of respect for your work, and you've probably met him. He's been teaching. I at think the I did. Yes, many years. Uh, I'm currently teaching design development. This is the comprehensive design in our School of Architecture in Room 305. We have an interesting ceiling. Is there a story that you could tell us about that? You mean at RPI? Yeah. Well, we were all a little inebriated and uh, toward the end of the year and we got up and stacked our, our, we stacked up our desks so we could paint with our hands on the ceiling. And we weren't that inebriated, but we were willful. And is that still there? I think it may oh, be. It is. It's, it's, it's the only <laughs> surface that, that uh, the Dean is not allowed to touch. There's there's no adaptive <laughs> reuse on that ceiling. Let me tell you, it, it's it's uh, it's part of the archival legacy of the green building, Peter. Yeah, but it, and it was a number of us that did it. it yeah. Uh, so it, to, to all those students who even are thinking about this, uh, 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 tofu, uh, a coffee, uh, something healthy is okay. But more importantly, is is I think that it's it's fantastic to think of a surface inside the green building, which is, becomes a drawing board, and that you've left this fantastic inscription. And, and no, you've you've been kind enough to leave it there and wise yeah. enough. Oh, I'm not touching it. It's 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 too important. No, no but I meant everyone, you know, over the years. Absolutely, from from, from uh, Patrick Quinn. Yes. David Havilland. It keeps going. Yes. Uh, many of the yes. architects. Yeah. Uh, here's a question for you. Oh. Changes in the profession. How has the profession changed since you launched your firm back in the 60s? And what stands out today as an exciting paradigm shift for you? And just three uh, references. Integrated design, interdis interdisciplinary collaboration, emphasis on sustainability today. Uh, and or new technology, 3D printing, robotics. Is there something that you, you've, you've found that, that is radically different at this moment in history that's changing our profession that you want to call attention to? Well, in a way, our tools have changed in that the computer's become omnipresent and a great tool. And then you just have to be, as we've said, a bit alive to the what you what the the uh, penalty of new tools is giving up all the aspects of old tools that may have had extraordinary uh, um, value, and uh, we would all say pencils are one of those. Um, but I think um, an ink. New things that have been new. I touched on one or two in the in the um, talk. For instance, when I pointed out that the the uh, box sticking out of the uh, woodsides, the house at Creekside at Woodside, um, that the kids were lying in, um, that really sprang from the uh, technologies that we were dealing with on the Apple stores. And while we did the Apple stores, that technology was changing, which was really interesting and, uh, and its possibilities. For instance, 
if you you may recall that originally the Apple store at, in the, on uh, Fifth Avenue had um, much smaller uh, size windows. Now it wasn't just a window issue; it was also a, a structural issue. Mm-hmm. And eventually, within I guess five or six years, no more than that, I believe, someone in my office could probably help my memory in that case. Um, we could make the structure, which was glass. Well, it was a combo of glass and plastic and uh, good connections. Um, we could, and Steve was very interested in seeing how far we could push that. And so, you know, we made a, a very few, much larger sheets of glass and more and and made it all work. I mean, it was much more. And so there is the technology changing. Yeah. What a wonder to be doing something just at that moment. And Apple supported, and we were having to get almost all of that, as I recall, think out of Europe. But we were beginning to do some buildings in China, for instance. And I, I, as I recall, Apple really supported uh, the Chinese developing those capabilities, which we used in the Apple stores. And, and on that note, Peter, that, that's, that's a kind of beautiful example, taking glass and, and, and uh, doing a kind of deep search in terms of finding a kind of latent intelligence. Did, um, on one hand, and you tell us how I'm reading this, on one hand, Apple is attempting to brand themselves. So the fact that the stores... More than attempting, they did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From, from, from an iconographic standpoint, being self-similar around the world uh, represents an advantage. On the other hand, is it fair to say that either at every store, every once in a while, they said, can you do something different with the glass this time around? Well, we did. No, they say. didn't, but we did. You did? Sure. Um, we did, but we tried not to, for instance, once we'd done the cube, we did not, um, and I, Apple never pushed us to do another cube that I can recall. Uh, but we did in, um, in China, and we were dealing in there with a circumstance where there are a number of um, circular elements in that part of the city. We made a, a, a cylindrical apple. Oh. Not the whole apple, but the part that rose up from the uh, paving. And it echoes the other circular elements there and there were any number of those and after we did the cube we then did a number of ones that were more like marketplaces mm-hmm. like upper upper west side mm-hmm. it's a market that was the first one and i took those out of the lecture because I, I knew i was going to have difficulty with time and therefore they show up if you looked at those little images but there are any number of different apples, often sometimes in an industrial environment, sometimes in a historic right. environment. You know, we did one at the Louvre and we did another in a bank in Paris. Steve was very much motivated by symmetry. Mm. And of course, most things uh, including human beings, are not symmetrical. We're not, right? If you look at our guts, they're not symmetrical. <laughs> and it's very interesting. Some parts are symmetrical, and they're very useful, like our eyes, the position of our eyes. And then the other things aren't. And, of course, in many other things, like automobiles, they are symmetrical to a point, and they're not, right? And so... It's really interesting to delve into all of that. And on Apple, we were able to delve into many of those. And there's some very interesting historic buildings that we were in 
for instance, the one I was about to tell you about was uh, the second one we did in Paris, as I recall, um, was like half a bank, half a symmetry, and we completed it. And now you, you take it as a matter of course and not recognize that the original apple or the original bank was not symmetrical. Right. I so mean, then, you, then you have this interesting thing about history of how you build on history or complete it, right? Did, did you guys have not necessarily arguments, but conversations about symmetry and breaking symmetry? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And he, he came around to, to your perspective now. Sometimes we just did it and he felt it was pretty good. Got it. Um, were there custom molds that had to be made, especially for that circular building for the glass? Uh, well, the Chinese, uh, with the encouragement from Apple, figured out and, and other people in the world how to do curve, big curved sheets. Right. So there is an example of that technology was shifting. Now, others were too. Uh, for instance, the connections, which is a great thing coming out of RPI. I don't think we ever talk much about that, at least I don't remember that. But the truth is how you connect things is a big deal. And you know, architecturally and emotionally, how you connect things, the beginning and ends of columns, for instance, you could say, if you look down through history, that's often really important, right? But technically it is too. Right. And so you begin to invent a bit. So if you look at our buildings, often the tops and bottoms of things are really looked at. And I mean, for good reason and refined. And the connections are, because they, they usually are the beginning and the end of something. But, but an architect ha has an option either to make kind of concealed details or celebrate the connection in terms of yes. mechanical fastenings. Yes, I, you do. I gather you enjoy showing the assembly of things, no? Well, we saw the opportunity for that and the pleasure of it. But the, we've done things where you, you almost always have to decide about truth, so-called truth, hmm. and have a sense of humor about it, too. I mean, I have architect friends who are quite good architects that really mean it about the idea of truth. And then if you look at it, you see all the irony in it. To get buildings done, they're often rather selective. Or sometimes a site is not uh, so pure. And the question is, do you choose to um, in, encourage that right. or or deny it, as an example. For instance, when I was in Les Gaza's office, my first job while at school, I was really interested in a building he'd done in uh, down around Wall Street. And it looked square. But if you look carefully, it wasn't because those streets down there often don't line up. And they're not at 90 degrees. And so, um, that's really interesting, you know, how, but in your head, you make it square unless you really look at it. So there are many issues about architecture like that. And then the question is, does the young architect just ignore all those kinds of questions and see them as opportunities and pleasures or just go right by it? Right. And I don't say that every architect has to, but... I certainly, in my view about my life as an architect, has often dwelt, dealt with things like that. Uh, Peter, here's a, a question from a student in the school, Megumi. Uh, she says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. You mentioned creating, in quotes, powerful experiences for the client and using the site to inform the designs for residential projects. And using everything. Yeah, could, could, could you speak more about your process of becoming more uh, familiar with relatively remote, heavily forested sites. Specifically, is the schematic phase of your design informed by the environmental analysis conducted via computer software, or do you personally hike around the property, 
use drone footage or utilize other methods? Both. Good, good answer. Good question. I mean, if you, no, truly, and that's of interest. I mean, and we, do, we can't always, often you just learn to be very observant. But the best thing is if you do both. But on a, the small, one of the smallest houses now that we're doing is about, I think, a thousand square feet. It was a little smaller, and then added, we added a bedroom. Um, but it's uh, very nice. I'm happy with it. And that one in particular, um, it's out in Michigan, but for a client from Pennsylvania, who's actually in one of the great universities. Um, and um, there, it, all these, it, it's interesting because at a small building like that, sometimes you can just do a dumb building, right? Purposely. Mm -hmm. But also, but then the question is, even a dumb building, do you glory in the weird, strangeness of things the way they get built? Or do you purposely tweak those? And the question is, at what point is that economically sensible or not? I don't mean our time, but a little building, one good thing is you can't expend that much energy and time in it, even as you do that because it doesn't have as many elements to think about. I, did I say that right? Probably. Oh, no, it's a great, and, and, but I think it's fair to say, given your, the way you opened this lecture today about your early years going to Connecticut and learning how to fly fish and your appreciation for the smell. I was a child. And yeah, you yeah. know what I found? Well, My, the worst flies I did did the best. <laughs> right. But is it fair to say that it's really important for you to visit the site before you start designing those houses? Yes. Yeah. Well, you to do the best ones, yes. But I can't do that always. And often others can, and they learn to do that too. And they grow. We all grow. But hey, if, Peter, once you're on that trail... Uh, uh, Peter, I have two um, comments from alum, and then I have a final question for you. This is from Stephen Whitney. From It's a comment, observation, uh, 1964. Thank you, uh, RPI, for arranging this lecture. Thank you also, Mr. Boland, for your creativity and knowledge. And this is from your colleague on my Dean's Leadership Council, Kathy Prigmore. Uh, I'm always amazed at how much consistency there is through the generations about how we at RPI Architects approach architecture, considering challenges and prevailing architectural styles, technology, craft, regional focus, et cetera. Humbleness, care for your clients and users. Uh, thank you for another wonderful lecture, Peter. And, and my last question and you can take it anywhere you want to go. I, I've always, uh, I often tell the students that uh, that even after graduation, you need to take responsibility for continuing your education. This That means surrounding yourself throughout your life with inspiring mentors. What advice, Peter Bolin, would you give to the next generation of architects in terms of curating one's life and career? Well, I think we're all different. Therefore, and, and your goals, on one hand, I guess your interests, and we're all different in our capabilities. For instance, I hate to admit this, but I mentioned it to Robert the other day when we were talking about technology. I went through RPI. In my day, there were no computers. I went through RPI without learning to use a slide rule, which is really dumb if you think about it. But somehow I figured out how to deal with that. <laughs> so, um, you know, thinking about young architects, I think now it's, I think I was lucky to be able to follow my path enough in that search and to be allowed to do it. But I'm afraid more and more in an academic world people may be less liable to put up with that. But I'm not sure that's true because it depends a lot on, I guess, people. 
And um, so looking ahead, I don't think you can always predict where you're going to learn or gain the most. Uh, for instance, how could I have predicted that Gerhard Kalman would be in Lascaz's office? What I, I remember Lascaz did the first international style skyscraper in the world in Philadelphia before going to New York. And the only thing I remember him saying to me was, don't bother me, I'm a busy man. <laughs> right. So how do you pick where you go? Well, it turned out I learned so much from something I wouldn't have predicted. I didn't know what I was getting into or get out of it something of great value, which really messed me up at RBI. I thought for about at least half a semester or a semester, because I was trying then to do too much. I mean, I was trying to think about all these at once. I've been sort of triggered to do that. Well, eventually you do, you you find you can do it. And, you know, and so how could I have predicted that? But Peter, you made a, on, on this note, you, you made a huge decision and one that had cascading consequences in the most profound way. You chose to go in to collaboration, right? With John Jackson and Bernard. Well, first, uh, first with Dick Powell. Right. And he was like my dad. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's how we survived those early years because there was this balance between um, the two of us. And, um, but on the other hand, I believe that much of my life, I've been a little too reasonable. But on the other hand, what does that mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. But if, if, if Sally will excuse the, the phrase, it, uh, it was a bit like a marriage with, with your partners and, and there, was yeah. a, there was a well, kind of common respect and, and, and synchronicity between all, all yes. of you, right? Yes. And but and getting back to your point about, let's say, John Jackson and Frank and others, um, that um, to some extent, I think, was because of the multiple offices, which in some ways could have been totally f foolish, but actually I don't think it was because it meant we weren't a totem pole that we were a modified totem pole and and John was in Pittsburgh, Frank started in Wilkesbury and then went to uh, Philly. Um, and, and there are a number of other examples of that within the practice. Not always people from RPI, but the same way of finding their way. And that has its uh, disadvantages too, because they're going to have their own way to do things, and one may not be as thrilled. Right. So how do you get the right balance? And I don't think we ever do, but it was worth it. I don't regret that at all. Well, the, the work speaks for itself, Peter. Um, it's almost nine o'clock. I want to I want to thank you on on behalf of uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, your your alma mater, the School of Architecture. Uh, all the alum that uh, were with us tonight. Um, and you'll have this in your file for others. Oh, yeah. I mean... It, and, and I know there are other people that I know who would like to see it who weren't able to see it tonight. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think I said it all in the intro. You're, you're, you're a school of thought. You, you've obviously fell in love with architecture early on, and it loved you back. I, I fell in love with it the first week I was at RPI. Yeah, and and you've you've spent your entire life uh, moving your creative imagination into the world, uh, into the built environment in in the service of others. And I can't think of a more profound and noble endeavor and gift to society. Uh, and we congratulate you. We're proud of you, and and uh, uh, we're we're grateful for everything that you've done for the profession and and for. And I'm not done yet. And I know you're not done yet. <laughs> sort of. I'm 80, I was 85 uh, three days ago. 
Happy birthday. And I hope to see you, Peter, in person. I hope uh, MPAC opens up in the fall and I'm able to bring you on campus and I'd like have that. us meet you in person. Uh, I thank you for your for your time today. Big hugs. There's a round of applause from from everyone that's that uh, is, is out of sight. You can you can see it in the chat box. They love you and they respect you. Thank you, Peter. No, and a great pleasure for me, truly. And I think I grew a little uh, thinking about what I should show and talk about what I shouldn't. <laughs> and, and, interesting. and we were the recipients of that. Thank you, Peter. Well, have, have, well, I was too, because it helps me to think about this biography that's coming up. Absolutely. You and I are going to keep in touch. Thank you. Okay. Big hug. Thank, thank you, everyone. And I think it is great that you've included others other than just architects. Uh, if everyone wants to put their camera on uh, for a second, and maybe, uh, John, if you can give us a grid of cameras with people's faces, that would be wonderful as a, as a kind of closing moment, if it's possible, technically. We'll see. Something's happening. <laughs> I, I often ask uh, the students to, to open their cameras so that our guest speakers can see everyone. Um, all right. Anyway, Peter, thanks again. No, thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch and we'll share this with the world. Have a great night. <laughs>